My name is Nick Sequin. I'm the Director of Sustainable Development at the United Nations Development Programme. And I have to say, I've, I've moved to New York a year ago, so I've come from Africa, having been work, working in the field on biodiversity issues for the last 14 years. So this issue is something particularly close to my heart, and it's a real pleasure to be able to be with you here today. This event has been organized by a number of agencies, CITES, the convention that's responsible for regulating um, the trade um, and utilization of um, illegally harvested wildlife and fl flora, UNDP, the organization I work for, UNEP, the UN Environment Program, UNODC, the World Bank, GRASP, the Wildlife Conservation Society, and the permanent missions of Gabon, Germany, and Thailand. The joint organization of today's event represents the type of coordinated response needed to tackle wildlife crime at the global, regional, country, and community level. We're really pleased today that this WCS Central Park Zoo Dialogue is the main World Wildlife Day event among over 20 parallel events being organized around the world. A special commemorative meeting of the United Nations General Assembly is being organized tomorrow to discuss the issue. Although our UN Secretary General was unable to join today's event due to other commitments, he did share a statement for the occasion, copies of which have been printed out and are available outside, in which he urges all consumers, suppliers, and governments to treat crimes against wildlife as a threat to our sustainable future. Our event today is designed to raise awareness of the illegal trade of wildlife, share some examples of the challenges and the solutions we have to dealing with the problem of wildlife crime, and then to complement the global World Wildlife Day social media campaign. And I see that many of you are probably are tweeting already. I see some of my colleagues are. And that's great, because we now have some 14 million linked social media followers um, for these events, which is wonderful. Now, we're very fortunate to have a number of distinguished speakers and panelists with us, in addition to many of the distinguished guests that are in our audience. So we're going to start the event with a series of opening remarks and statements. Then we're going to have a panel discussion moderated by Dan Harris of ABC Nightline, followed by comments and questions from the floor, closing remarks by UNODC, and then a reception hosted by UNEP, which will be outside as you leave this building to the left. It's not in this building. Throughout the event, we'll have a series of powerful advocacy videos, which are part of the global awareness raising campaign. And these include two videos that demonstrate the power of the celebrity voice and feature UNAP Goodwill Ambassador Li Bingbing, who has a personal interest in these issues and over 17 million Weibo followers. Others, like WCS's Matriarch clip, tell stories that provide powerful testimony to the experience of a species as a whole through the eyes of one elephant. Great apes face an equally uncertain future as elephants and rhinos and other species, and the GRASP film that we'll show highlights their plight. And we'll hear the voice of community champions like Josephine Ikiru, cultural conservation ambassador from northern Kenya, and she was an Equator Prize winner for the work she's been doing, excellent work in Kenya with the Northern Rangelands Trust. And then finally, the EU Environment Commissioner has kindly provided a video message to close the showcase. So as you can see, we have quite a full agenda, so let's get on with it. Our first speaker, Christian Samper, is the president and CEO of the Wildlife Conservation Society, and he sits on President Obama's advisory council on illegal wildlife trafficking. Christian, um, can you take the floor, please? Thank you very much, Nick, and good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for joining us here at the Wildlife Conservation Society in the Central Park Zoo. We're delighted to partner with all the organizations that Nick just mentioned and to come together as the United Nations and the world community celebrates World Wildlife Day. Uh, we're delighted. Some of you had a chance to be out there and, uh, before in the zoo and see the snow leopards. Very appropriate today on our, uh, a day like today to see these snow leopards, these magnificent animals that we work on in the field. And I think what's powerful about having a place like the Central Park Zoo or the Bronx Zoo or the New York Aquarium is these facilities offer a window into the world. These are places where, in the case of this zoo, more than one million people come in every year. 
More than 180 million people visit zoos and aquariums in the U.S. every year. And these people come here to interact with wildlife, and we use these as an opportunity to tell the story. Part of what makes us different as WCS is the breadth and the depth of our field programs. For more than 120 years, we have been working doing field conservation around the world, and today we have a footprint working in more than 60 countries tackling issues around saving wildlife and wild places. Whether it was working with governments and communities to establish parks like Kruger National Park in South Africa back in the 1920s, or most recently, the Wakan Park in Afghanistan last year. Clearly, the topic we're discussing today is something very important, wildlife trafficking. We are delighted to see the importance that the issue is getting, and it is important that it's an issue so important that we all need to work together to be able to tackle it. Let me tell you a very personal anecdote. Uh, just a few months ago, I was visiting a national park in northern Mozambique called Nyasa National Reserve. Nyasa is an extraordinary landscape in the border between Mozambique and Tanzania extraordinary geology, and one of the largest concentrations of wildlife in all of Africa. It also happens to be the front line of the ivory crisis. The most recent data that we have suggests that about 70% of the elephants in Nyasa have been lost in the last few years. As a matter of fact, the work, the field surveys that we have done as the Wildlife Conservation Society with many of our partners have indicated that we're losing about 35,000 elephants every year. That's 96 elephants every day. It's one elephant every 15 minutes. This prompted us to come together and figure out what we could really do to stop this. And we came up with a three-pronged strategy that we feel is extraordinarily important as we tackle this. Stopping the killing on the ground, stopping the trafficking and disrupting the criminal networks, and stopping the demand in the sources and the places where we see this, uh, people buying it. Whether it's right here in New York, in the streets of New York, where ivory could be bought six months ago, or whether it's in China or any other country around the world, we have to tackle this issue. Not that we're against using wildlife, but we feel it needs to be sustainable, and it's not only about the wildlife, but the livelihoods of the people that rely on that wildlife in these communities. So we're delighted to see the conversation that we're gonna have today and the panel, and we're hopeful as we see a number of important announcements that are coming together this week. Just to mention some that you probably saw today or in the last week alone. For example, China has come forward and announced a one-year ban on the import of ivory. There is increasing leadership that's showing the commitment to try and stop the demand. The U.S. here has adopted a very important implementation strategy following the executive order by President Obama on wildlife trafficking that's brought together all of the government agencies. And this week alone, including today in Kenya, Kenya has just announced and has done the burning of some of the ivory stockpiles, and it will be followed in the next few days by a number of announcements by African countries. So it is going to take all of our work together, all of the countries, all of the agencies and civil society to be able to take this. And we're delighted to begin this dialogue and to say, let's be serious about wildlife crime. We look forward to this dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. I've worked with WCS for many years. You used to do great work on the ground. I'd now like to turn to the ambassadors from Gabon, Germany, and Thailand. That's Ambassador Marianne Bibelou of Gabon, Ambassador Harold Braun of Germany, and Ambassador Chayapan Bamrungpong of Thailand. Please. Dear friends of wildlife, today we are celebrating at numerous events across the globe the beauty of wild fauna and flora. We are also recognizing the invaluable benefits that wildlife provides to people. It is our joint task to protect wild fauna and flora in their many beautiful and varied forms 
for this generation and the generations to come. Today, wildlife is in danger more than ever, despite all the efforts undertaken at national, regional, and international levels. A record 1,215 rhinos were killed in South Africa alone in 2014, representing a 20% increase compared to 2013. Rhino horn fetches up to 60 5,000 US dollars a kilo, making it more valuable than gold. Between 20,000 and 25,000 elephants are poached annually in Africa, out of population of no more than 650,000. For forest elephants, the population declined by 60% between 2002 and 2011. A single dead elephant's tusks have a raw value of 21,000 US dollars. The latest alarming development concerns another icon, iconic animal, the giraffe. It is increasingly being pushed for its bone marrow, said to be a remedy for HIV AIDS and according to reliable estimates, the number of giraffes has declined from 140,000 in 1998 to 80,000 in 2012. A kilo of bone marrow is said to yield, to yield up to 120 US dollars. Illicit trafficking is also on the rise with regard to many other species, including great apes, pangolins, turtles, crocodiles, and others. Friends of wildlife, Gabon, Thailand, and Germany are firmly convinced that the time is now, more than ever, to get serious about wildlife crime. If we fail, rhinos, elephants, giraffes, and other species will face local and maybe global extinction. If we are not able to stop poachers and traffickers, future generations will have to look in their history books to see elephants, tigers, and rhinos. Moreover, Many countries are increasingly suffering from the adverse economic, social, and environmental impacts of wildlife crime with direct implications for livelihood and sustainable development. Poaching and illicit wildlife trafficking can also undermine national and regional stability. Revenues generated by criminal groups in a number of African countries directly contribute to the fueling of conflicts. The scale and nature of wildlife crime is a pressing global problem that requires shared solutions at all levels. No one country, region, or agency working alone will be able to succeed. The need for an enhanced collective effort within and between states, regions, and agencies is obvious. This includes working across source, transit, and destination states, and tackling both demand and supply. The fight against wildlife crime is our common and shared responsibility. This includes the United Nations. A number of UN agencies already work on wildlife crime. Various UN bodies have passed resolutions which also concern wildlife crime. The Security Council has acknowledged wildlife poaching and trafficking as a threat to peace. In its resolutions on the Central African Republic and on the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Security Council authorized targeted sanctions against poachers and traffickers. This is important, no doubt about it. But Gabon, 
Thailand and Germany are deeply convinced that more can and should be done within the United Nations and specifically here at its headquarters in New York. So dear friends of wildlife, with this in mind, the UN Group of Friends on Poaching and Illicit Wildlife Trafficking has been established by dedicated members of the United Nations, including Gabon, Germany, and Thailand, with the aim to raise awareness among the UN membership of the alarming trends in wildlife crime and the urgent need to step up our efforts to fight this scourge. At the high level debate convened by the President of the UN General Assembly last week, we reaffirmed our continued commitment to combat wildlife and forest crime. We called on all member states to make illicit trafficking in protected species of wild fauna and flora involving organized criminal groups a serious crime. In line with the provisions of the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. In 2013, we adopted a General Assembly resolution by consensus of all 193 member states to proclaim March the 3rd World Wildlife Day. Last year, we celebrated the first ever World Wildlife Day at the UN headquarters. It is encouraging to see that this day is getting ever-growing platform and forum for all stakeholders, citizens, civil society organizations, the private sector, government, and international organizations. Let's continue on this path. Let's send a signal from this meeting that we are determined to put an end to wildlife crime. Let's get serious about wildlife crime. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask John Scanlon, the Secretary General of the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna to please come to the podium now. Um, this happens to be the anniversary of the coming into force of this important convention, and I think it's really quite apt that World Wildlife Day is being held on March the 3rd. John. Thank you very much, Nick, and uh, Honourable Ambassadors from Gabon, Germany and Thailand. Uh, the President of the UN Environmental Assembly. Uh, thank you very much for the extraordinary leadership you continue to show. And we should remind everyone that it was Thailand at the uh, 16th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to CITES that put forward the idea of World Wildlife Day and then carried it to the General Assembly. And it must be pleasing to see what it's turned into. Uh, thanks to also all the partner organisations, their names are up there, I won't read them out, but also to WCS in particular for hosting us uh, this afternoon. I think everybody's seen very graphic images of elephants and rhino that have been slaughtered for their horn or their ivory. Um, it's a tragic crime scene that is being replicated across their range every day. What these images capture is that the brutal effect that this has on these particular animals, but what it doesn't show is what lies behind these images. What it doesn't show is the impact that this illegal killing is having on entire species, on ecosystems, on local people, on national economies and on regional security. And nor does it show the faces of the transnational organised criminals or the rebel militia who are driving this illegal trade. These individuals are corrupting officials right across the illegal supply chain. They are recruiting local poachers. They are reaping high profits at the expense of local people and of national economies. Nor does it show what these particular criminals and rebel militia are doing with the proceeds of their crimes, investing in all sorts of illicit activities. 
I gave the observation of elephant and rhino, but unfortunately you could make the same observation talking about multiple other species, plants and animals. The crisis we're confronting is not a natural phenomenon. It's not the result of a, a drought or a flood or a cyclone. It's the result of people. This is a direct impact of what people are doing to wildlife. And if we're going to combat it, we have to work out what is driving these people and how do we stop them. And in the time I have available to me today, I just want to highlight some of the, the human aspects that are perhaps behind this illegal wildlife trade. I'd like to focus on three particular human characteristics. Greed, ignorance, and indifference. If we think of greed, this is the transnational organised criminals, the, in some cases the rebel militia, uh, who are pursuing profit with no regard for people or no regard for animals. These people are not going to be influenced by a campaign showing dead elephants or dead rhinos or impoverished people. Exactly the same as people that are trading in narcotics. They're not influenced by seeing pictures of, of dead people uh, who've been uh, the result of their illicit trade in narcotics. Um, these people are only going to be influenced by two things, risk and profit. And these are the two aspects we have to tackle if we're talking about these individuals. And for risk, what do we need to do for risk? For risk, we need to start identifying, arresting, convicting, jailing and imposing significant monetary fines and seizing the assets of the people that are at the end of this chain, the kingpins. But in order to do that, we need to treat wildlife crime as a serious crime and that's defined in international conventions. And not only treat it as a serious crime but start deploying the same sorts of tools, techniques and penalties that are applied to other serious crimes such as illicit trade in narcotics, or trafficking in persons. The sorts of things we're talking about there, covert operations, controlled deliveries, the use of modern forensics, and we're starting to see this. The second human characteristic is ignorance. And this is really the people that go out and buy illegally traded wildlife without knowing it's illegal. Or they do know it's illegal, but they have no sense of what lies behind that, what the consequences of their actions as a consumer are. And now here culturally appropriate public awareness campaigns can reach these people, can alert them to the fact they need to be more responsible buyers, can start alerting them to the fact of the true cost of purchasing illegally traded wildlife. That's the cost to wildlife, the species themselves, but also to local communities, also to national economies, to regional security, and also that buying that illegally trading wildlife is putting money directly in the pocket of hardcore criminals and rebel militia with all the things they may spend that money on. This will reduce the market for illegally traded goods, reduce the profit, and hopefully have an impact on not attracting as much criminal interest in the trade. And civil society has a key role to play here. The third human characteristic is indifference. And this is possibly the hardest one to tackle. And here I'm referring to the indifference of a customs officer who thinks wildlife crime is not a big deal for me. Or the enforcement officer. Or the prosecutor saying, do I really have to prosecute a wildlife crime? Or the judge. Or the politician who says, is wildlife a big issue? What's the impact on rural communities? Or the general public? How do you deal with indifference? And this is where leadership matters. And what leaders say, what political leaders say, and we've heard it from the president of Gabon, we've heard it from multiple leaders, saying wildlife crime is a serious issue and I, as the head of state or head of government, treat it seriously. That permeates through the entire system. It says this is a priority for government. You cannot turn a blind eye to this anymore. This is important for government and this is where leadership matters. The other area where it can work is where you have high profile personalities, uh, be they members of a royal family, and we've seen what Prince William's been doing globally. It could be sports star, uh, movie stars. These sorts of people, when they, when they say this is an important issue, it has an effect on the public. And the general public view is that, oh, wildlife crime then looks like it's a serious issue. And it also has an impact on how we value nature. We value nature culturally, um, scientifically, recreationally. So what people in the public spotlight, what political leaders say is matters, and that's how we can address indifference. So they're the three human characteristics I think we need to tackle. Greed, 
ignorance and indifference. And the positive news is that significant work is underway in relation to all three. A number of states are now moving to treat wildlife crime as a serious crime. They are deploying the same sorts of techniques and tools and penalties to combat this crime. We are seeing public outreach campaigns right across every region uh, going on. And I was just in China, there's significant public outreach campaigns there. I was just in Thailand, significant campaigns going on there. I was just in Vietnam, significant campaigns going on there and in this country itself. And we are seeing extraordinarily political leadership. Uh, the three countries that are sponsoring today, Germany, Gabon and Thailand, uh, but I was just in China, I had the opportunity to meet with the Vice Premier there, uh, in Thailand met with the Deputy Prime Minister. The extent of political leadership is growing and is having a significant impact and there are numerous personalities, including Nadia here today, who are lending their voice to this campaign. And this has been complemented by efforts being taken to work with local communities to look at their livelihoods, to look at engaging them as actors in fighting against illegal wildlife trade. More bit of positive news is the UN is working as one here. I think you can see it from here, but it extends beyond this. And perhaps one very positive way of looking at it is that through working together, collectively, together with the non-government sector, the social media campaign has been extraordinary. This thing called a thunderclap, I don't know if you're all familiar with a thunderclap, but it's a way of having greater impact with Twitter. Uh, this year we got over a thousand people sign up, we reached 14 million people through that. And Lisa was telling me that the wider reach with the hashtags that we've been using, World Wildlife Day and Serious About Wildlife Crime, has reached 147 million users. So by working together, the collective outreach has been quite extraordinary. So we are confronting a serious challenge. Um, we do need to do more, but there is a lot going on within and between countries. This requires a collective effort across the entire illegal supply chain, source, transit and destination countries that is coming. One example of where we're making progress, we just released the CITES mic data today. And if you look at East Africa, it's not a, the same story all parts of East Africa, but we are seeing a steady decline in the poaching rates such now that the poaching rate is lower than the natural birth rate, but a steady decline there. That's the result of this collective effort. So we have to look positively. In Central and West Africa, we've still got a number of issues we need to, to deal with to pull these numbers down. So colleagues, with the growing level of political commitment that's evident here in New York today, with the frontline measures we're seeing taking place across the entire illegal supply chain, tackling both demand and supply, and the sort of momentum that is generated through events like this, convinces us that we can win this, but it depends on people. And how quickly we do it depends on all of us, including all of us here, and I conclude by thanking you for your personal commitment. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to <coughs> introduce Dr. Oyan Sanja Suran. She's the President of the United Nations Environment Assembly, and... Um, Invite her to say a few words, please. Your country faces a large number of wildlife problems, white poaching problems of its own, snow leopards and other things. So we'd like to hear a little bit about that. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors, uh, distinguished guests. I'm delighted to join in New York at the celebrations of the World Wildlife Day in my capacity as United Nations Environment Assembly President. I would like to commend the collaborative efforts of UN by UN member states, UN organizations, non-government partners, goodwill ambassadors, and all distinguished personalities who are committed to this occasion to honor and advocate wildlife. I would like also to thank the Central Park Zoo and Wildlife Conservation Society for hosting all of us. This event could not be timelier. The planet, planet's wildlife is at the critical juncture of irreversible change. All available evidence points to the sixth major extinction event in the Earth's history. Unlike the previous five events, which were due to natural transformations and disasters, the current loss of biodiversity is mainly due to human activities. The magnitude of habitat and landscape modifications, increased rates of species extinction, and the reduction in genetic variability due to population declines are having devastating impacts for the prospects of all life on the Earth. Many consequences of this impact remain uncertain, but major negative effects are already foreseeable, but could be avoided or at least mitigated. 
As we move towards the universal post-2015 agenda and the sustainable development goals, with the hope of improving the human and planetary well-being, it is our duty to recognize and address severe challenges, such as the threats to wildlife. Last year in June, in Nairobi, all member states addressed the issue of the wildlife, illegal wildlife trade at the first United Nations Environment Assembly. I'm proud to say that uh, recognizing the economic, social, and environmental impacts of illicit trafficking in wildlife, the uh, member states adopted a resolution focused on the illegal trade in wildlife and put this issue as one of the top priority issues. And we called at the UNEA that the General Assembly in New York should consider the issue at its current session. UN, UN Environment Assembly supports the repositioning of illegal trade in wildlife in the multilateral agenda, adding to the political foundation required for a more decisive, coordinated, and coherent international response. A recent report prepared by the UNEP and Interpol, and it's titled Environmental Crime Crisis, estimates that global environmental crime is worth up to 213 billion US dollars every year and it is helping to finance criminal, militia, and other illegal armed groups, undermining the rule of law, peace and security, and sustainable development. The illegal trade in iconic species like tigers on the trade in ivory and rhino horn resulted in unprecedented slaughter of elephants and rhinos throughout Asia and Africa, and many know about this crime. It is, less it is no less important to recognize the fact that illegal trade involves a wide range of species, including insects, reptiles, amphibians, fish, mammals, plants, and timber. From box turtles and pangolins as pets or for consumption, to bears, predominantly for bile farms, the situation is really dire. Much of the wildlife is often used for pharmaceutical, ornamental decoration, traditional medicinal purposes, or become part of the transnational pet trade. So stopping or discovering wildlife in transit alone, whether alive or dead, or their parts will not be enough to effectively curtail the rapid decline in biodiversity that we are currently faced with. Tackling illicit wildlife trade demands multidimensional responses and proactive approaches. Moving forward, we should also aim at un understanding better environmental and so social drivers the economic dynamics of the legal and illegal exploitation of natural resources, the scale and types of correlated crimes, and the role of illegal trade in fueling conflict, among many determining factors. Increased public awareness, strengthening local and national capacities, assessing legal frameworks and policies, furthering transnational cooperation, and ensuring that punishment adequately fits the crime become all instrumental. Collective action must be taken to support origin nations to effectively combat poaching and improve conservation. The commitment of transit and destination countries is equally required. Ladies and gentlemen, the post-2015 agenda offers a unique opportunity to promote cooperative and transform transformative action. Therefore, I feel that the crucial importance is for us to develop a strong indicator to support countries in monitoring this issue, monitoring the wildlife and the natural wealth. This would heed the call made by all nations gathered in Nairobi last year at UNEA to build a holistic and coherent approach in tackling illegal trade in wildlife and its impact on sustainable development. We all agree here there is, it's a very dire circumstances, but there is still time, we still have time to act. If we are to succeed in protecting our wildlife through the quelling of illegal tr wildlife trafficking and other conservation activities, the international community must come together and consolidate an international, concerted, resilient effort in doing so. All of us are needed in this endeavor. Thank you very much for all the cooperation, and we hope that this um, momentum will continue and we'll, uh, we'll all work together on this very important issue. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Sanjay Saran. May we now have the first of the two sets of videos that we'll be watching this evening, please. Hi.
I am a actress. I actually come from China. As the ambassador of UNEP this time, that's why I came to Kenya. I guess I believe many people don't know about this process of selling the ivory. We need to do our biggest effort to stop this ivory trafficking. This is the head of the elephant. Wow. And the tusks actually come out of here. So these are the tusk cavities. So the tusk wow. comes out of this great big hole and it comes all the way out here like that. Wow. And so if the tusk is taken, it can only be taken by killing the elephant. She was speared, probably with a poisonous spear. She walked and this is where she chose to come and die. Later on when she died, you know, the whole face was removed. This is one of 50,000 elephants that have been killed in the last two years. That's what we know. It's probably many, many more. An animal. Why people cry for them? I just feel so sad. It's really too tiring. Today, I came here to see the real world. It's like this: the truth is so real, the truth is so powerful. When it comes to you, the feeling of the nature gives you the feeling of crying. It's like you want to cry so bad you want to cry. 整个象群也会在因此的许多年里处于崩溃的状态。你知道，你其实有能力改变这一切。没有买卖就没有杀害，请帮助我们，让更多的人了解真相。so different to you and I. Our worlds exist side by side, mirror images of the other, separated only by a thin veil of unawareness. Like you, I came into this world heralded by a loving family. A childhood followed, filled with noise and play and mud. Lots of mud. Our extended families would gather at special times throughout the year. Joyful times with plenty to eat and drink. In times of scarcity, we would push on under the knowing eyes of watchful mothers. Like you, we mourn our dead and we cherish our young. We have rich language and long memories. We recognize ourselves and can distinguish the past, present, and future. And we are all too aware of what is happening to so many of our kind. Of your kind, there are those who do us harm. But there are also our protectors. The dangers are many, but so are we. Together, we will fight for our right to exist. the largest of all who walk this earth. I am the architect of this landscape. I am a mother. I am a sister. I am a daughter. 
I'm the matriarch, and this is my tale. Thank you very much. I mean, that was an amazing set of films, and we have two more to watch later. Um, I'm going to now um, introduce uh, um, Dan Harris, you anchor for ABC Nightline, and you're a distinguished journalist. Um, you're going to be looking after us now for the rest of this session. And um, if, if you may come to the front, that would be great. And also to introduce the other panelists, um, Aldo Lael Demos, the Deputy Executive Director of UNODC. Doug Cress, the Program Coordinator for UNEP GRASP. Sue Lieberman, the Vice, Vice President for International Policy at WCS. And Ambassador William Brownfield, the Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs at the US State Department. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. I consider myself a, a friend of wildlife. I've had the enormous privilege while working at Nightline to cover um, rhinos in Nepal and uh, tree kangaroos in Papua New Guinea and uh, cheetahs in Namibia and gorillas in the Central African Republic. Also, my wife and I have three rescue cats in our house, and they're a huge pain in the ass. Uh, so let me just open, start with a, an, a question that I'd like to get all of you to answer. Um, the US recently took some pretty high pro hope profile action to deal with this issue, and now the UN is obviously organizing a couple of days worth of events. Um, however, we've known about this problem for a long, long time. So what has taken so long to quote unquote get serious? Um, I'll start with you. Right. Well, I lived in South Africa for many years, and um, I can tell you that back in 2007, 2008, we lost 13 rhinos a year. Now we're losing three a day. I mean, this problem has just overwhelmed the capacity of the country to deal with the crisis. I mean, it started off small, and then it just ballooned, and, and, and it was incredibly complicated in terms of the large number of actors involved. In fact, it was a transboundary crime and the country was overwhelmed. It was really struggling to keep up. And I think that's been the case everywhere. I mean, I think it's taken a while for people to sort of, c countries to come together and say, hey, we can't resolve this the traditional way just by depending on park rangers in our protected areas, um, trying, to, trying to, you know, to fight the problem. Um, we need to have a concerted global effort which looks at what we need to do in the source countries, brings everyone together from the police to the customs, to address the problem down to the countries which demand the product. Yeah, uh, in the more than, I hate to say, more than 25 years that I've worked on wildlife trade, this isn't new. Illegal wildlife trade has always been a problem. In fact, it's one of the motivations for the signing of the CITES Treaty on March 3rd in 73. But we have never seen, on the one hand, this level of engagement of transnational organized crime, of criminal syndicates, um, in, in, the, in the trafficking, whether it's of ivory, rhino horn, pangolins, et cetera. That there are a number of reasons for that. Reasons include much easier transport routes, also breakdown of governance and increase in corruption in, in a lot of countries, in a lot of places that's underpinning so much of this. By the same token, though, we've never seen it this bad. We've never seen this level of engagement, political level. And what we need to do is turn this great attention from governments, from UN agencies, this unprecedented collaboration that you're seeing here today, UN agencies and, and conservation NGOs. But we need to turn that into action on the ground, stopping poaching, stopping trafficking, and stopping the demand. I think it can be done, but we, need, we cannot use the tools of the 1980s to solve the problems of today. We need to be as clever, as smart, and as organized as the criminals themselves. Um, and I want to have a million follow-ups for both of you, but I just want to say that just in case people are wondering who's speaking here, that was Nick Sacred and obviously Sue Lieberman, but, and, and Doug Kress is going to speak next, but I would just ask people to sort of introduce themselves um, as we go. No, no, no problem. 
I'm, I'm still Doug Cress. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just to follow on what both Nick and Sue say, we have a perfect storm right now that we're, we're encountering. There are seven billion people on this, on this earth and everybody wants something. All the natural resources were meant for far fewer people. So we're grabbing, we're pulling, we're taking, we're stealing, we are not putting back. We're very poor custodians right now of the earth. But also, all of the incredible advantages we have, the, the techn technological age we're in, has made this very easy to poach. It's very easy to, uh, to play a, at a very high level as illegal traders. Um, the, uh, all of the information, the technology, the fact that a, uh, someone can just simply, with a telephone, uh, SMS the GPS of where an elephant is and, and just walk away from the scene. A few moments later, in his phone, he'll get a payment. He's far from the scene of the crime, and already the poachers know where to find the elephant. It's simply a, a telephone, and that's all it took to set up a, a crime that can be heinous and can have tremendous devastation. Mm -hmm. So all these great tools we have at our resources, so do the bad guys. We just need better tools, and we need to be a bit faster and more aggressive. They have an incentive, as John Scanlon said. You know, it's, it's profit. We need to find a way to make the risk much greater and the profit much less. I'll do a lot of demos at, um, of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Then let me tell you that uh, it took us a long time, and Ambassador Brownfield may agree, it took us a long time to recognize... I frequently do, Aldo. Human trafficking, human trafficking, it took us a long time to take it as a serious crime. Uh, we're there now, and I think we're starting to get there as well uh, as regards wildlife crime. I think it's what John Scanlon mentioned earlier, it's just the sheer indifference and ignorance behind this. And also, the, um, I think the work of CSOs, of, of civil society, in, in making this frontline news is, is very important. I think we also are starting to recognize that a lot of poverty is involved here, a lot of poverty in Africa, in Mexico, in Bangladesh, wherever we work. We work in 12 countries. Uh, we also have to learn to take care of the needs and the governance requirements of people in these areas to actually make a dent. And I am, by process of elimination, I must be Bill Brownfield, uh, the United States Assistant Secretary for Drugs and uh, Law Enforcement. Uh, and, and let me close on a more or less a positive note. Uh, the answer to your question, in my opinion, is this. The bad news is it takes the human race a long time before we reach consensus on difficult or troubling issues, sometimes decades or centuries. Wildlife trafficking falls into that category. The good news is, once we do, we usually take very effective action and steps to address the problem. May I suggest that I am in this panel here, along with the distinguished gentleman to my immediate right, two people that would have been out of place in this sort of panel as recently as three or four years ago. Why? Because we represent the law enforcement community. Uh, Aldo through the United Nations system, me through the United States government. But our presence here, I would like to think, reflects that we actually are now realizing that we don't just get serious about wildlife. That is what other communities have done so superbly and nobly for decades. We are now getting serious about wildlife crime and that brings in an, an additional set of resources, tools, and capabilities. Well, let me stay with you, William, because um, as you know, President Obama made a pretty big announcement on this issue recently. There were critics who pushed back and said, not enough money here, and uh, Fish and Wildlife doesn't have enough people to check the, what's coming in through the airports, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I know you don't, uh, you're not President Obama and you don't work for Fish and Wildlife, but you are the representative of the U.S. government on this panel, so let me chuck the question at you. Actually, as you can imagine, I do work for President Obama, and I work very closely with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, which in my opinion is one of the most extraordinarily competent organizations in the world in terms of what they do. Uh, are those points true? Do we in fact not have as much in the way of resources as we would like to have? Are we starting in this process later than we should have started? Yes and yes. That does not change my fundamental position at the start, which is we are now moving in the right direction. Let me take my budget as an example. When I started down this road in 2012, my budget that was dedicated exclusively uh, to combating wildlife trafficking was a little over $6 million a year. Now, we scraped together from other sources, but that was our starting point. Uh, I went from 6.2 
two or six or whatever it was, to a little over 10, uh, to a little over 15, and this year I'm at 25 as part of a larger $55 million package. Do I wish, could I make good use of $550 million rather than $55 million? Yes, I could. Uh, could I be happier if I lived in a perfect world? Yes, I would be. My own view is uh, rather than us focusing on how much more we wish we had, we should be spending our time as we are, I believe, in calculating how we can get maximum value from the resources that we have available, what additional steps we can take with those new resources, how we can use them most effectively in a bilateral, country to country, or multilateral part of the United Nations system. And my own view, as I said at the start, is I think we are now moving in the right direction. Uh, I was going to work my way back because right. you have a follow-up, but let me just ask a question and then you can either do your follow-up and answer the question. Which, but the UN, uh, and I'm not an expert in this, but you know, obviously there's a couple days of events and, and World Wildlife Day has been announced and we've heard some speeches. What can the UN actually do as opposed to say right. so we can to stop this problem? <laughs> We're in the business of doing more than saying right now. I was going to mention uh, the U.S. is obviously not alone among member states. They have good friends, and, and the International Consortium on Combating Wildlife Crime, which uh, sort of brings together some of the people here, the Society of Secretaries, ourselves, the World Customs Organizations, Interpol, the World Bank, are very staunch allies of, of the U.S., of Germany, of Gabon, of many countries. What can we do? First of all, we have to, we have to build very strong partnerships within the U.N., the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has been calling for this. The President of the General Assembly, tomorrow I will be joining him on the podium precisely to celebrate that we have, look, we mentioned the UNDP, UNEP. We have a lot of um, entities that have something to contribute here. As far as UNODC, the Drugs and Crime Program is concerned, we have a fairly narrow but probably very important mandate to fulfill, and that is to help about 12 countries right now on our list of clients to improve the legislations to get their the judicial systems much stronger to prevent this crime, but also to investigate, to prosecute, and to sentence. So Dan, I would say that if we work together, if we manage to work together, as we've done in other areas, in counter piracy off the coast of Somalia, if we really get together with CITES, with UNDP, with UNEP, I promise you, I am convinced that next year, as we celebrate the 3rd of, of March, we will not just talking about ringleaders that were caught in Nepal, or in Eastern Africa, which is true and very encouraging. Hopefully, we'll have many, many more success stories, especially of law enforcement at work. Doug, what, what do you think the UN can and should do? Uh, I work at the UN. I work, as many of us do in the room here, and on the panel up here. Um, traditionally, the UN has been um, a leader in, 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 in symbolic ways. And certainly, that is an important role the United Nations can play now and is playing. It is setting a tone through its member states, but also within the United Nations, that environment is a priority. We now have a United Nations Environment Assembly. That did not even exist one year ago. That, is, that puts environment very much at the forefront. And I think as long as the United Nations continues to put environment into all of its major documents, major speeches, major speaking points, it becomes, <coughs> as Ambassador Brownfield said, it becomes part of the vernacular. It becomes accepted. It becomes part of budgets. It becomes a, a priority. But there's also practical things the United Nations is doing now that often get overlooked. For instance, we at GRASP work very closely with the United Nations peacekeepers in Central Africa. And they're there to keep the, the peace in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But they shuttle around chimpanzees and gorillas for us all the time. So when they get confiscated and they need to get them to a sanctuary, these guys load them onto the, the helicopters and, and planes and trucks and move them around as part of their mandate, which is to protect the natural heritage of Central Africa. And they're currently now crafting their language for this next mandate, which has a much larger piece of, uh, of environmental policy in, inside it. It's making environment part of your job, part of your day in, day out job. You want to pick up on that? I can pick up on it. I do not work for the United Nations <laughs> or, or any longer for, for government. But I think in order to tackle this problem, there needs to be action at every level. And first and foremost, we have to stop the poaching. We have to work with governments to build their capacity to train, to, to provide the tools, the equipment, the motivation to rangers on the ground. 
And one way to build the political support and the political will for action that needs to be taken at the national level, both on the ground and stopping the movement of illegal wildlife and stopping the traffic across borders, one way to create political will to, to foster that, one way is bottom up, but the other way is top down. So from the UN level, from the level of the United Nations, the various UN agencies that are here, it can help stimulate and motivate governments to take action. We've seen through CITES, for example, attention and putting pressure on governments who may not be fulfilling their obligations on ivory trade, rhino horn trade, and others. That sort of intergovernmental environment can, with press, can put pressure on governments to take action back, back back home. I think we're seeing at the UN now, even though I think you know, sustainable development goals may not solve all the problems of the world, but the UN right now is focusing on what are the goals, what's the development agenda for the next, for the next 15 years. And one of the targets that the, all the member states now are agreeing on relates directly to wildlife crime. If we can get that adopted, and, and we believe that, that there's tremendous support for that, then we'll see efforts of governments, efforts of UN agencies, efforts of donors at fostering sustainable development will also pay attention to stopping wildlife crime and doing everything we're talking about here. So basically, uh, I think that every action needs to be taken at all levels, but the action at the UN level and UN agencies is absolutely critical to this. You want to crack at it too? Yes. I mean, I work for an agency which has a very large biodiversity program. It's $1.5 billion plus portfolio. And we're very proud of that, and we're very proud, for instance, that we've contributed to major expansion of protected areas on the planet, you know, in the last three years, larger than the size of Switzerland. But while we were sort of expanding protected areas, we were losing the wildlife from under our feet. Um, we had major issues, and, you know, we were working in some of the largest elephant um, rangelands in Africa, and, for instance, in Gabon, in Minky Bay, and elsewhere. And, and um, notwithstanding our efforts, we were losing wildlife. So the question is, is this a good investment? And, and we realized that we couldn't just continue business as usual. We needed to do something different, business unusual. And for starters, we needed to work within our organization with different parts of the house, the people who dealt with anti-corruption, the people who dealt with rule of law, not just sort of deal with the environment team, the people who were dealing with livelihoods and jobs, de people dealing with poverty, looking at that, that, that side of things. And we realized we certainly didn't have all the expertise inside our organization to address this. We needed to work with the World Bank. They have expertise dealing with money laundering. They have a lot of expertise dealing with biodiversity and livelihoods and poverty very relevant to this agenda. And similarly, our colleagues in UNEP and in UNODC and Interpol and others. And so it's taken us a while, but we've actually had to re-gear, re-engineer our programs, come together around a common agenda and to say, look, we bring this to the table, but we certainly don't bring the rest. And this is a sort of a microcosm of what's happening globally. Per our estimate, we're spending around $45 billion a year on conservation across the world. Okay? It's not insignificant. So the question is, yes, we need more money, but how do we use that existing money more effectively? And certainly the conservation community cannot do it alone. You're going to need to move beyond the park boundaries. You're going to need to work with customs. You're going to need to work with the police. You're going to need to work with the judiciary. You're going to need to work with the people dealing with money laundering and the bankers and so on and so forth. And you need to work across borders. And I think by re-engineering the way we work, using those resources in a different way, more smartly, we can make a difference. And yes, we do need more money. But let's not sort of um, stymie um, efforts in terms of trying to make progress by sort of claiming that we can't do it because we don't have resources. We can do things with the resources we have today. I'm going to throw out another question and we can just work our way back. Um, I've never worked for government. Uh, I've never worked for the UN. Probably will never work for either of them, uh, <laughs> especially after the obnoxious tenor of my comments today. Um, <laughs> So you guys throw out a lot of acronyms um, and talk, and it's just striking to me to listen to you talk about how great it is to get different parts of the same organization to work together, which is uh, just you know culturally to me sort of odd because you work for the same organization. Can you get your act together fast enough to save the animals who are disappearing in real time, according to the, to the statistics that you laid out at the beginning of this conversation. I think we can, but I'd also say that we're no different from any organization, whether it's government or non-government or a business. I mean, different organizations and um, have many different parts, and just by the nature of the way we organize ourselves as a species, people, 
you know, we tend to work in small clusters, small, you know, in small, small groups of people most effectively. So when you're trying to mobilize at scale across organizations, it takes time. And that's the same whether you work for Coca-Cola or IBM or you work for the UN. So that's, that's, just, that's just a bottom line in terms of how organizations operate. But yes, we think we can. I, we think we, with the resources we have on the table, um, working with the countries and really addressing their needs and looking at how they do things and see and make, really looking at how they re-engineer the way they do things, we can make a difference. But it's not going to be easy. This, this thing, this point I made around us starting from a fairly low baseline with rhinos in South Africa to where we are today, that did overwhelm everybody. And, and I think we need to recognize that and be honest about that because we need to, you know, through honesty, I suppose, we find our solutions. So you talked about action being taken or being needed at all levels. Can this action be taken quickly enough to stop what seems to be a precipitous slide in population levels? I think it can. I mean, I think, I think we're seeing there is sufficient motivation now that I, you know, if certainly the organization I work for, WCS, working with our partners on the ground, working with the various agencies here, working with private donors and, and Private, uh, private industry, we know what we need to do. This isn't rocket science. We know exactly what we need to do. We know how to stop the poaching. We know how to protect wildlife. We know what we need to do. We know how to stop trafficking, and we know where the problems are, and we know where the demand is. So I think if we just pull together and make sure that we, that we work together in such a way that, that we measure our effectiveness, and that's something that we don't want to have 25 agencies and 25 organizations all working at cross purposes and all really having good hearts and hoping they're making a difference. We really meet, need to make sure at the end of the day what we're trying to accomplish is to pr stop the poaching, stop the trafficking, and stop, stop the consumption, the purchasing. We have to be smart about how we measure that. We have to monitor the wildlife populations. I think we can do it. It's hard work. We're committed to doing it, but it, it is hard work. But there, this is no, we can't, we can't, let up any of the pressure right now because the situation is is already close to out of control. Although I know you want to speak, but let me hit Doug Sorry. in the way. Oh, uh, somebody say something? No, no, no. Go ahead. Um, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, yes, the United Nations is, can be slow at times. I'm sure ABC News is crackerjack at all times, right? <laughs> not a problem. <clears throat> I'm going to reserve the right not to comment. Okay, <laughs> just checking. Um, it's really only. Two I'll be years. asking the questions. Okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. It's only two years ago, really, that inside UNEP we began to talk about wildlife and wildlife crime seriously. Uh, not serious crime, but in a serious manner. So in two years, it has gone from being some very small conversations uh, in, in different offices to something on the global scale. So that, that was nimble, far more nimble than I've ever seen the UN behave before. One thing that actually has helped, though, is the scale of this problem is so dramatically large. It is global. And it's not simply a moral imperative to go out and save elephants or rhinos or gorillas if you happen to feel compassionate. It now plays into the fact that it, it's disease transmission. It, it plays into the fact that GDPs are being stripped away and natural heritage is being stripped away and countries are unstable now politically. It, it meets almost every, every bell in the room for the United Nations, so it can engage on this level. Before, it was almost too small of a problem, which is sad and perverted to say, but it's true. It now literally can be engaged um, engage with on, on every single level, every single agency has some dog in this fight now, and that's, that's really quite helpful. Other? Dan, we, we, we don't have obviously a, a, a silver bullet or a formula to get rid of this problem in, in one month or one year or ten years, but we have worked very hard with many partners on fighting drugs and crime in, in, in other aspects of, of, of transnational organized crime. I can assure you that we are ready within the UN to, to, you know, to yield results much faster, much better. In fact, seizures are up as regards wildlife trafficking. Arrests are up, you know, uh, indictments are up in, in many parts of the world. We have people, our own office has people in 12 countries right now, experts working on, on better intelligence gathering, on investigation, on sentencing. So we are making, we are making a, a, a we're moving forward quite rapidly over, as, as Ambassador Brownfield mentioned, we have been, in this, uh, specifically in the wildlife crime business, uh, for the past two or three years only. And I think that we are yielding results and we will continue doing that. We are extremely committed to this. I first met Aldo Lale about eight years ago in the Republic of Colombia, where he was running the UNODC uh, country program. 
focused heavily on drugs, and I, be, I was the U.S. ambassador to Colombia. And I mention this only because at that time in the year 2007, all the questions that he and I were receiving sound almost exactly like the questions that you're putting to us right now, except in those days it dealt with drugs. Today we're talking about wildlife trafficking. We've been at this for so long. Where are the results? Why can't we get organized? Why has it taken us this long? Uh, why have we spent this much money, dedicated these many resources, and we do not at this point have the quantifiable data to suggest progress? That was about eight years ago. These days, people are practically bending over backwards to congratulate Aldo, and from time to time, even me, I'm not nearly as handsome as he is, but nevertheless, for the extraordinary things that were accomplished in our Columbia efforts a decade ago. I suggest this to you in order for everyone in this room to keep in mind that these sorts of efforts, these sorts of programs, take their time. We did not get into a wildlife trafficking crisis overnight. We are not going to solve it overnight either. Now the problem, as you very correctly point out, is we are in a race against the clock in this particular exercise because once a species is eliminated or extinguished, we cannot, as I understand, modern uh, medical technology, recreate it uh, once it has become extinguished. So there is a legitimate issue that you raise in terms of how long will it take. But my suggestion to all of us is we are not engaged in a 100 meter dash. We must think more in terms of a marathon in terms of when we will accomplish the desired objective. But final thought, I also would remind everyone here, particularly those who have ever been involved in the law enforcement business, to accomplish your objective, you do not need to create a perfect earth. You do not need to eliminate all criminal activity. What you need to do is raise the cost of them doing business by a certain percentage. It might be 10% or 20% or 25%. When you hit that point, then these people who are in this business for money will decide to move into some other endeavor. And that's a matter of addressing demand, addressing supply, and locking up the right number of people in jails uh, for a long enough time to have that sort of impact. Your points are very well taken. Um, and don't sell yourself short, you're both very handsome men. Um, just let me stay, staying with you for a second, since you're with the State Department, we know that there are a couple of countries that are really the source of a lot of the demand here. China and Vietnam come to mind. Why not just slap them with sanctions? Yep. Uh, look, while we could have a long and entertaining discussion right now in terms of the effectiveness or lack of effectiveness of sanctions, uh, and we could have an argument, and I'm sure we could split this audience uh, right in half in terms of whether sanctions actually accomplish their desired objective or not, whether sanctions are unilateral in nature uh, and therefore counterproductive or not. I, I will not, and, and, uh, uh, and therefore will not, uh, take a position <laughs> on, uh, uh, on this, uh, the, 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 this larger set of arguments. Wait, we can all agree, I believe, that you will accomplish the objective better if all countries and their governments will actually cooperate and agree in terms of what you are trying to accomplish. And it is easier still when you're dealing with an issue that to a very considerable extent is a moral issue and a scientifically logical issue, such as the moral issue, do not butcher and exterminate entire species of animals uh, for profit. And the scientific issue, if you will, is once you have exterminated those animals, uh, you will not be able to recreate them. And therefore, if you're strictly a businessman, uh, the rhino horn, uh, the elephant tusk, will not be available in the future. That is a matter on which I think we have had some success 
uh, in, in developing consensus in the international community. I have the distinct pleasure and honor of leading the United States government's side uh, to a, 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 an exercise, a bilateral exercise between the United States and China that we call the U.S.-China Joint Liaison Group on Law Enforcement, uh, a, 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 a process whereby we meet systematically to address joint law enforcement issues. Over the last two years, we have added uh, wildlife trafficking to the agenda. And I would suggest over the last two years, the cooperation, bilateral in nature, has improved between the United States and China. Both nations over the last year and a half have engaged in a massive ivory crush where we have destroyed beyond all possibility of, of retrieval vast amounts of ivory. Both nations have contributed uh, substantially to efforts to combat wildlife trafficking. Both nations have made commitments uh, in, in international fora to address the issue. And we have gotten there, I suggest, without the use of sanctions or the threat of sanctions. Anybody else want to take a uh, uh, run at whether sanctions is a good idea? And uh, I guess I, we have to be a little bit careful because, as I understand it, the number two source of demand globally for wildlife is the United States. Which uh, I would have acknowledged had yeah. you put the question to me squarely. <laughs> 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 I can see why you were such a successful but, diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say just that. And I think the p issue here is that everyone's a culprit, everyone's a victim in different ways. And if you go and talk to the Chinese counterparts, they're facing problems with the legal wildlife trade themselves. They're losing snow leopards, you know, they're losing iconic species, things that really matter to them. You go to the Vietnamese, they're losing things like the Tonkin snub-nosed uh, monkey and other critically endangered species you know, to, to, to bushmeat consumption, transboundary bushmeat consumption. So they're really concerned themselves around their own species. And I think we need to sort of move away from a pointing fingers, us and them sort of paradigm to sort of really engaging everyone around the issues and recognizing that every country, China, Vietnam, and others included, face this problem themselves. And they're very concerned about it. And, uh, you know, things that are really important to their cultures are, are, are being taken, and, and that worries them. Well, we have a couple minutes, but let me let the three people in the middle here. Yeah, I mean, briefly, in. I think there, there is a time and a place for sanctions. And we have seen over the past 30 years, 20 years, cases where the U.S. has used a very powerful piece of legislation it has called the Pelley Amendment. If a country is found to be undermining the effectiveness of an international conservation treaty, there can be a threat of sanctions. And in fact, the U.S. did impose sanctions on, on trade on, in wildlife products with, with Taiwan, threatened it with China. This was over rhinos and tigers back in ancient history in the 1990s. But it, and it was effective, and the sanctions were lifted. But the goal isn't sanctions. The goal, is, the goal is compliance. But I think it's important to have both a carrot and a stick. We see that in the CITES processes, where there is a discussion if countries do not fulfill their obligations, do not do what they themselves have committed to do, then, then there can be a threat of sanctions. But the goal should never be sanctions. The goal should be compliance. But in addition, I think we have to look at ourselves, whether in the US, Europe, or China, and look particularly on the ivory issue and say, are we promoting trafficking? Are we ena being enablers by tr for trafficking by having domestic ivory markets? So the US, is, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the Obama administration, is making great strides now in closing loopholes on ivory trade in the US. And several states in the US have now said, that, no, no more ivory at all. And, and we know that issue is being discussed and considered in China. What's going to change things in China is if they were to close their ivory market. If they were to close their domestic ivory market, you would see that the, the risk for traffickers would go up. In addition to all the enforcement that has to be done, absolutely. But that's what really needs to happen. We need to look at this creatively. The US is looking at shutting, closing loopholes on its ivory market. The Europeans should as well. And so should China and Vietnam. Aldo and Doug, we have just a minute or two. I can be real quick because Sue took a lot of what I was going to say, so thank I'm you. Sorry. No, 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 that's cool, but I was going to say one thing. Um, as as uh, Christian Samper said today, Kenya burned uh, 15 tons of ivory as part of its World Wildlife Day celebrations. And it's very clear that we're talking now about uh, there are three definite stops in any illegal trade. There's a, there's a, 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 a 
or origin, there's a transit and a destination country. We understand this chain now. We understand that there's many players in the illegal trade. But when that first ivory was burned in 1989, nobody said a word about China. It was just a burned pile of ivory that was meant to be symbolic for an illegal trade. But no one was taking it out of Kenya. No one was, no one was making that argument in a global sense like we are now. That I find very encouraging, that we understand there's a much bigger inter interlocked picture here. Aldo? Well, China, uh, a couple of days ago, on the 26th of February, uh, announced a one-year ban. I know that some commentators look at this with a bit of skepticism, but I mean, that is a major step forward. And I would say something else. We have to solve this problem with China sitting at the table. We got to take a break to watch a few movies, and then we'll come back up. Is that right? Yeah. All right, let's do this. Right. We lose more species to illegal wildlife trade run by organized crime. Buying and selling protected wildlife products is a crime. Don't be part of it. Great apes have become a commodity. Pushed to the brink through deforestation, hunting and disease, the great apes, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas in Africa and orangutans in Southeast Asia now face another sinister threat. An illegal live trade that feeds growing markets in Asia and the Middle East. They're smuggled in crates labeled dogs. They're stuffed into automobiles alongside drugs. They're carried in handbags, backpacks and suitcases, transported along waterways, or shipped under falsified travel documents that defy common sense. But there's no doubt that great apes occupy a highly symbolic piece of the multi-billion dollar global environmental crime. In 2013, the Great Apes Survival Partnership, or GRASP, published Stolen Apes, the first report to establish baseline data on the illicit trade. The publication analyzed seven years of seizure statistics to gauge the scale and the scope of the black market, which is estimated to have involved nearly 23,000 great apes from 2005 to 2011. Stolen Apes emphasizes a chilling fact. What was once a haphazard trade that emerged as a byproduct of the bushmeat crisis, it's now a cold and sophisticated business with links to organized crime, facilitated by transnational criminal networks and fueled by standing orders from abroad. The hunting of apes is driven by market demand. The continued loss of so many great apes in Africa and Asia could cripple the ecological health of those regions. Tougher law enforcement stricter punishment and a global awareness campaign that closes down both ends of the supply chain are required now before it's too late. I do believe that the land without wildlife is a cursed land, and the land with wildlife is a blessed land. When you kill wildlife in your land, you bring, you bring a curse in your land. Conservancy uh, really has played a big role to bring peace and security, to deal with the peace and the security issues in my community. But today we are not killing each other, we are living in peace and unity. Our people are empowered. They know more about conservation. They love uh, their own wildlife. This wildlife has really brought a lot, has really brought a lot to our lives as pastoral communities in Northern Kenya. It is time to get serious about wildlife crime. 
the European Union has joined in the fight. We will intensify the cooperation with our international partners to step up the global response. We are working on a new strategic approach for wildlife conservation in Africa that we hope will increase the funds available for action. An important tool in the fight against wildlife trafficking is the CETES Convention and the European Union is soon to become a party to it. We will also use EU diplomatic and trade policies to address the problems at the heart of wildlife trafficking, such as corruption and the growing demand for illegal wildlife products. We are going to uh, open it up to questions from people other than me. Uh, go ahead. Can you uh, say, uh, tell us who you are? Okay. At issue here is that we have a technology revolution which has made it easier for poachers and syndicates to operate, but it also makes it conversely easier for us to operate, for us to join the dots in terms of our work. And I think you find, you know, the internet has got its underbelly, whether it's with drugs or it's with wildlife trade and so on. And yes, um, you know, it, it must have helped to facilitate the trade. Um, but maybe our colleagues in UNODC can, can speak specifically about that I'm subject. Afraid, I'm afraid you're right. I mean, the, the internet is actually making life easier for, for some of these uh, fully organized crime. I mean, cyber crime is a huge problem, whether we're dealing with drugs or with human trafficking or with child pornography or wildlife crime. So it, <laughs> but on the other hand, we cannot live without it. It is also, as John mentioned earlier, also our best, enemy, uh, our best friend when it comes to advocacy, just to live with it. If I could reinforce just briefly what Aldo has just said. I've been in my job now for four years. It seems that no one can offer me anything to get me out of my current job, so I perhaps will remain in it until I die. Since my old man made it to 95, that may be another 40 years or so from now. Over the last four years, two new areas of criminal activity have come onto our scope big time. One, obviously, by our presence here today, is wildlife trafficking as a criminal issue, not as a conservation, preservation, or environmental issue. And it is that as well. The second is cyber. And you've just put your finger on the intersection of two 21st century threats to the human race. Anybody else? Yes, uh, in the white shirt. Just tell us who you are before you ask the question, if you don't mind. Hello, Linda Rollins with IPS Interpress Service. Uh, a couple of you spoke about the importance of working with local communities. I'm not sure if you're aware of the advocacy work that organisations such as Survival International are doing around working with Indigenous and tribal groups and how, how do you um, protect them and also use their knowledge um, because Survival International is saying that sometimes actually it's um, seen as perhaps when um, when um, conservation efforts are implemented on the ground that sometimes um, it's seen as a bit easier to actually target the tribal groups rather than these international crime syndicates who are probably a little bit scarier and harder to um, target. Go. Any well, I work for the United involved. Nations Development Program and um, so this is really critical to us, I mean, because we are the development arm of the UN, and so we really look at jobs and livelihoods and addressing poverty and, and so on and so forth. And for us, um, the community is really the first point of entry in terms of dealing with these issues. And it's around understanding community livelihoods, trying to ensure that you can, that you can actually match wildlife with those livelihoods, address the real needs of communities, such as human-animal conflict um, and the impacts that wildlife raiding has on their crops as part of a holistic strategy to deal with, with this problem and not just look at it as a security issue as important as that is. So clearly, the, in the response that we have and we've agreed to as a global community, um, there is a very strong anchor in terms of looking at this as a community issue and recognizing here we're, we're, not, we're looking at illegal trade. We're not looking at trade per se and we're not looking at use per se. 
and obviously for many communities and for indigenous peoples around the world, sustainable use of, of wildlife, sustainable use of flora, um, for medicines, for food, and for other and for other and other purposes, are really critical to their survival. So, working with those communities on, uh, to, to to ensure the sustainability of that use, often in situations when their world is changing quite radically, with a growing population or the commoditization of of, of their community and you know, entering the monetary world and so on, and and so that's a very large part of the response. We haven't discussed it much, but um, clearly and critically going forward. Um, this is this is as equally important as, as the other as the other as the other anchors of the response. Yeah, if I could, yes. uh, Nick made a good point, and this sounds so simple and so obvious, and yet we often forget it. Very often, especially in the United Nations level, we pass around documents all day long talking about reducing the illegal trade, diminishing the illegal trade. It's illegal. There's no no need to reduce it. How about stop it? Because it's, it's, if it's illegal on a global scale, it's illegal on a local scale, too. There are laws in every single country to protect most of these species we're talking about. Uh, it, it isn't that indigenous communities should be allowed to do something illegal because they're indigenous. It's illegal. And we seem to somehow forget that. It sounds so simple. Um, and yet it's, it's really uh, at the very foundation of this. These species are protected. They are they're covered by by CITES and dependencies for a reason, and they are endangered. And there are laws that to protect them. Those laws must be defended. We have a question in the back up there, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. My name's Crawford Allen. I'm from Traffic. Uh, I had a, two very quick examples I wanted you guys to reflect upon, if you would. Um, one of our, our hosts here today, the Thai government has, uh, working with traffic, implemented DNA testing on ivory in its market recently and showed that approximately 80% of the ivory in that market was from African elephants rather than what was before, before believed to be from Thai elephants and therefore being illegal. Therefore, we're seeing a proof of the smuggling into the Thai market and using a technology that can quite rapidly now and fairly cheaply provide solid results. Um, another example is that today the USAID have launched a wildlife crime tech challenge calling for innovation and technological innovation to deal with this crime issue. Um, how much do you guys actually think that technology is a silver bullet? How much do you think it's misleading? And do you think that we're going to see a time when t technology is really going to help us get ahead of these of this criminal networks that are involved? Say, uh, Crawford, I'm sorry I didn't recognize you. You've helped Nightline do stories on bushmeat in the past. Thank you. You do good work. Thank you. I hear that, I hear that a lot. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, right off the bat, I mean, I think you're, you have a very important point. Science is on our side. Sampling of ivory, sampling of timber is something else we're doing with, with many friends within the UN with iQuick. Uh, definitely our best friends as we improve the capacity to investigate and prosecute uh, these crimes. Yeah, to respond to your question, Crawford, um, technology is not a silver bullet, but it's, it's one bullet we need to use. It's, it's the technology we use and the, the, what's available to us today, we need to work much harder to find tools that can help us, help us with identification, help us with enforcement, help us, for example, we work in the field with, with WWF, WCS, and CITES and other organizations on soft, software that rangers can use the smart software to help them do their jobs. We at WCS have developed a new, a new smartphone app that's used in China for identification of wildlife products in the markets in Guangzhou and other cities in China. There are a lot of really good potential technological tools, but there's no magic silver bullet out there. We need to be smart about using all the really exciting tools that we have and work with the people who, the, the people who invent these things, but that's not all that we need to do. We need to do good old-fashioned intelligence-based law enforcement. We need to go out there and make sure that criminals are not only arrested, but also <coughs> prosecuted and, as has been said, serve time. That doesn't require high tech. It requires political commitment, it requires ju the judiciary to com be committed, et cetera. So my answer to your question is, yes, we need to use those tools. The USAID Technology Challenge is a fantastic opportunity, but we can't, we shouldn't rely only on the, on the, the fancy tools. We need to use all the tools that are available to us. Sir. 
And we are, yeah. Richard Jordan, Royal Academy of Science International Trust, with a question for Nick. Is there an interagency task force that deals with uh, this specific issue? Uh, I'm sure UN World Tourism Organization could be involved, but I just don't know if there is such a, a task force. Yeah, there are a number of different groups that have come together, IQIC being one, um, with the bank and um, UNODC, Interpol, and others. Um, but most recently, the Secretary General actually put this on the agenda of the Policy Committee which means it actually got addressed at the highest level in the UN in terms of actually looking at wh what the UN should do to respond. And so it's, it's at that sort of macro level, yes, it's been addressed and, and, and there's a coalition ar around addressing the problem, but really the big issue is uh, making sure there's action on the ground and we move from talk to action. And of course that's really working with the countries and putting in the national strategies and the frameworks for collaborative effort amongst government institutions and building the capacity to do basic stuff like crime scene investigation and basic forensics without any of the high tech stuff because they're really, that's, that's where often they really lack the skills. And, we, and we're coming together around that, so the set of, of national strategies, um, national platforms in Tanzania and Chad and elsewhere um, where, where um, you know, ultimately you know, different agencies will bring different, 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 different things to the table. Uh, the gentleman behind uh, also had a question, I believe. Yeah, hi, uh, Mike Casey with CBSNews.com. You know, this is actually inter we're not going to let anybody from CBS. Exactly. <laughs> I figured there'd be a little bit of a conflict, but um, you know, uh, in terms of the panelists, I mean, I've heard, and in fact, everything I've heard, I've been probably hearing for the last five years in terms of this conversation. Sue and I know, go back a ways, and I mean, you know, what's one thing that is in the works that you might be have might be coming out in the coming months initiative that could be a, a game changer something that you that either on the ground or technology or something that could make a difference that for us folks writing the news could be a top line other i'll give you one answer a global report on wildlife crime believe it or not it doesn't exist and when john mentioned earlier that we have to battle indifference and ignorance one of the first things we have to put on the table is evidence to, you know, to inform policies, but also to convince mothers and fathers in, demand, in countries where the demand actually exists why this is actually happening, what is behind all these factors. So the one answer to you is, now hopefully we'll be able to deliver it before the end of this year, which is the first real global report on the state of the art of this particular heinous crime. I'll offer a few even operational headline type things for you, which are very micro in nature, but I'll throw them out anyway. One you just heard about. Uh, some people have developed, uh, some very smart people have developed an excruciatingly uh, intelligent uh, technological approach using DNA to pinpoint with a high degree of precision exactly where these elephants came from whose ivory has in fact arrived in country X or country Y. This is a terrific law enforcement tool as you figure where to place your resources and concentrate your efforts and presumably produce results that can then generate your headlines. Second, uh, we are in the second year now of a multinational, it involves 40 or more different governments, uh, cooperating for a finite period of time on wildlife trafficking cases. We call it COBRA, and since this is the second time we've done it, COBRA 2. COBRA 1 actually produced several hundred hits, cases that actually are being prosecuted in four different continents, one, two, three, four, yeah, four different continents around the world, uh, which presumably will have some sort of impact. Third idea, in the year 2013, following, and this is bilateral, U.S. only, but it can be picked up by any number of other governments or organizations around the world, uh, the United States Congress authorized something called the Transnational Organized Crime Rewards Program, where my government, the United States government, is, is authorized to offer big substantial rewards of up to five million dollars uh, for information leading to the successful investigation and prosecution uh, of individuals or organizations involved in transnational organized crime. The first one we rolled out to the tune of a million dollars, which for some people is a lot of money, uh, involved an organization called the Se Savang Organization based in Laos, which we assessed at that time was the world's largest 
wildlife trafficking organization with operations in Southeast Asia, elsewhere in East Asia, and in Africa. Now that, from my perspective, is something big, particularly if, as I hope, but am not yet in a position to report, uh, it generates an actual active case, a prosecution, and eventually taking down a substantial organization. Three concrete examples I would offer to you. There are a few people. Oh, actually, go ahead in the back. Yep. Hello, my name is Jia Jung. I actually work for the music industry protecting another endangered species called songwriters and composers. But um, <laughs> uh, when you're speaking of uniting many different initiatives, governments, agencies, departments within those agencies, um, well, that's a lot of work. And this is not an expression of any cynicism on my part. I'm genuinely curious. I'd like to know, even amongst the five of you, sitting here, what you think is the overarching motivation for yourselves, be it, um, and your, and your organizations, be it uh, economic or security related, political even. Um, and I ask that as somebody who, just as a citizen, it, it's really more just a matter of the heart and concern for the environment around me. So I'm very curious. Wasn't clear. Overwhelming motivation for what? Yeah, why, why, are, we, why, are, we why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That. I mean, like, what, what do you all agree upon? Like, what do you think would be the, the umbrella motivation to, to take it back to way and trying to um, just do all the work involved in, in coordinating yourselves? And also, like, I guess the flip side of that would be what's at stake um, truly is should you fail not to be able to do it in time or, or just. You, um, not meet the goals. I'm but, not saying that you won't, I'm just... But, I mean, trying to answer that, I think, yes, we have a common objective, but we may have different motivations as to why we're each engaged, and I think that's realistic. So, from our, our perspective in UNDP, in the development program of the UN, we're concerned about people's livelihoods, and we see lively, uh, wildlife as being a natural asset, um, a capital for countries and for communities. In some countries, it contributes a major part of, um, of, of, of national product. I mean, a place like the Maldives, for instance, biodiversity contributes some 97% of exports. That's because that country depends on tourism and fisheries. And if you have illegal fishing and shark fishing, for instance, as, in, as we haven't talked about marine resources, but a huge problem. Um, Why are you pointing to me? Sue yeah. worked very hard <laughs> on trying to ensure that there was a, that we that we that we made some moves and some, had some successes in CITES dealing with sharks. And I think we're all very. Happy she did that. I mean, you were a bit of a hero for many of us. But anyway, so you take those sharks, okay? You're undermining the economy of that country. And it's the same for, for elephants and so on. And in countries like Botswana, I think you've got 12% of GDP, 15% in the case of Namibia, which is attributed to wildlife. And, 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 and this is really the future of communities. And, the, and you know, it's their livelihoods that are, that are being threatened here. And, and you have these big syndicates coming in and privatizing what is a public good, belongs to the community, um, for their own gain. And, and, and it's adding to inequality. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a few big wigs getting rich, because clearly the um, poacher um, you know, who's you know, taking the hit isn't getting very much. We know that, but for rhinos and elephants and elsewhere. So um, that's why we're motivated. Go right on down right the line. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, why I'm motivated, why WCS is motivated, is we're committed to, to conserving and saving wildlife in wild places, to making sure in future generations there, are, there is wildlife. There are wild species. There are wild places for their, for their own sake, but also for humanity, so that we have a health, healthy species and wild places out there. In terms of wildlife trafficking in particular, it, it's driven by human greed, and we are, people are stealing. They're stealing the wildlife, but they're stealing from the future of local communities as well. So what you ask what motivates me is I want to stop people from stealing from the future by stopping, by stopping wildlife crime, basically. Doug? Well, we all, um, first of all, I can't speak for, for the United Nations Environment Program single-handedly because it's much larger than any one person. But I think every one of us up here tippy toes around the same topic, and that's economics. It's economics. It's, it is driven by um, profit and loss. And a perfectly good example of that, for instance, is of all the great apes in the world, the only population of great apes that is going up in number are mountain gorillas in East Africa. And that's because they make a fortune for the countries that, that, that have them. 
Uh, right now, every single mountain gorilla in Uganda is worth $1 million a year in gorilla tourism revenue. In 2013, Rwanda reported $294 million in gorilla tourism income. Those gorillas are virtually doubling in number. It's almost too many gorillas now for the space they have. But because they, they pay for themselves, because they have a value, they are very well protected and are allowed to thrive. And I think that's one of the issues we're having to face, uh, as Nick said, natural capital, the valuation of natural capital is a complicated and fairly new uh, science, but it's one that's, that's taking over. And wildlife and wild spaces have to be able to pay for themselves to some degree. That sounds cynical and it sounds kind of cold. Maybe that's a 21st century way of looking at some of these issues, but there's no doubt that it does pencil out. If, a, if an animal or a species or a, or a protected area can pay for itself, it will get protected. Well, wildlife crime stifles, in fact, kills any development prospects for entire communities in many countries. But I will tell you something else what motivates me. It's the, the illicit proceeds, the income that they derive, $10 billion were mentioned, up to $150 billion. I can assure you much of that actually pays other forms of crime, not leaving uh, outside, you know, illicit, uh, illegal armies doing a hell of a lot of damage in these countries and our own countries. These are the kinds of stuff that motivate me is protecting the development, sustainable development prospects of people in these countries, but also protecting ourselves from pretty nasty people. Sure. I mean, as you can imagine, you worked your way down the line and you get now to the harder law enforcement response. Uh, Aldo and I are at the law enforcement end of this panel. Uh, I mean, quite bluntly, uh, whether, whether one is trafficking in people, trafficking in timber, trafficking in counterfeit goods, trafficking in drugs, or tra trafficking in wildlife, uh, illicitly and illegally poached, uh, the objective from the law enforcement community is to investigate, prosecute sentence and incarcerate. Uh, and that is what is driving us. I'll close on this, however, with a personal comment. I also am a human being. I am the son, grandson, great-grandson, and great-grandson, great-great-grandson of West Texas cattlemen. Now, cattlemen are not known uh, throughout the entire planet uh, as great supporters of conservation and preservation. Oh, my father, I mean, every given year, he would take two to 400 of the little critters, he'd fatten them up, and they would march off to market. Uh, and I presume you all know what happens when they go off to market. But on wildlife trafficking, the old buzzard, who's gone now, would say he actually was strongly supportive of that effort. And are you ready for this? He said, because it's wrong. And sometimes things are so simple uh, that a moral response is actually the right way to look at it. Is that a very sophisticated assessment of why we should be opposed to this? No. Does it work for me? Yes. I think it's quite beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so there are a few people I do want to hear from specifically. I believe there's somebody from the World Bank here. Go ahead. And I actually have a question for the panel. I'm Valerie Hickey from the World Bank, and it's a real pleasure for us to be here and to be part of this group, because I think this is the first time in a long time that I'm seeing in real time a very mixed up, wonderful world, where we have conservation folks talking about law enforcement, yeah. and we've got crime fighters talking about the fact that it's wrong to kill orangutans. So I think this is a wonderful world. But of course, we're the World Bank. My job isn't to save animals, much and all as I love them, and those, those videos made me extremely sad. It's my job to end poverty. We invest anywhere between 50 and $70 billion every year in fighting poverty. And we've come to the conclusion that we can't get to zero poverty without stopping poaching. And we know that for sure. We've done the economics. We're in the middle of doing a um, very sound economics-based, rigorous and robust analysis of the economics of ivory trade. We have our folks who work in anti-money laundering who've come up with incredibly good methodologies to make sure that the proceeds of illegal wildlife trafficking can be seized. So we're changing that risk-reward balance that John so eloquently talked about. But one of the challenges we always have, of course, is this history and this tension that's always existed between conservation and development. And I know it's not always something we talk about, but it's very much there, and it's there with many of our counterparts 
within ministries of finance, for example, in the different countries in which we work, where they're making very real trade-offs between the money they're spending every year between building another school, putting more rangers on the ground to protect elephants, for example. How do we change the face of this debate so that it's not about conservation? So it's not just about crime, so it's about development. How do we do it in a way that emphasizes, not just as a narrative, that wildlife crime is anti-poor, we all know that the wealth of the poor, over a third of it, is based on natural capital. It's nature that provides some shelter. It's nature that provides some startup capital. It's nature that attracts jobs to the rural frontier where otherwise the private sector isn't going anywhere near. And it's wildlife trafficking that's robbing them of jobs and robbing them of entrepreneurial opportunities when contraband is entering what are otherwise legitimate natural resource-based industries. So we all know this, we all talk about this, but, but in real time we've also met a lot of ministers of finance who think this is a wonderful narrative, but it's a Trojan horse for conservation. That at the end of the day, what we do care about are the orangutans and the elephants and the rhinos, and we do, but that's not all we care about. So I'd love to hear from the panel, how do we convincingly and compelli compellingly make a different case I'm only going to let one person on the panel answer that because we're running out of time. There are a couple more people I need to hear from, so I'm going to put on you. Well, Valerie and I spend a lot of time discussing this <laughs> very issue. And I think, for starters, the conservation community hasn't been very good at putting their, themselves in the shoes of ministers of finance. Ministers of finance look for a number of things. Of course, you know, the dividend to the economy, but they also look at bang for the buck in terms of how effectively you spend money. And they tend to be, and I started off in finance myself, um, tend to be pretty clear-headed, I might say, but also pretty cold in terms of looking at logic and reality and not looking at emotion. So, very simply, it's about engaging with that persona, understanding the psychology of such a person and having a conversation with them. And frankly, it's not impossible. We've done it in countries from India to Costa Rica to South Africa and elsewhere, where the country's ministries of finance have agreed to put money, resources into this, because they realize that it, there's an economic contribution, but they also realize that if you do things differently, you're not just throwing bad money after bad, but you're actually helping to get some results for the better use of public money. We've got just a few minutes here, but there are four people I need to bring in. Uh, is there somebody from Interpol here? Yes, sir, go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Ben Perez, uh, representing Interpol. Um, first of all, I'm very happy to be here and been invited to be a part of this. And one of the comments I just wanted to share, especially related to a couple of questions that were made with why now, what's different, what's happening. I can tell you from the International Crime Police Organization that I represent, just five years ago, uh, there was two individuals that manned the desk that, ha that dealt with wildlife crime. Mm. And just in the last two years, that unit has grown to over 35 people wow. and is now a subdirectorate wow. within the special crimes and analysis area. So there's a lot of, a lot of attention and interest being, being uh, beneficial to a lot of organizations. Interpol is one of them. One of the things that we wanted to underscore is, again, a one-of-a-kind operation that's never been done in Interpol, which is uh, we called Operation Infraterra, which is quite simply a roundup of uh, fugitives under the system of red notices. Uh, there have been roundups of fugitives in other parts, in other crime types, but never for environmental crime. Uh, actually, we, we accounted for 139 wanted fugitives out of 39 countries wanted for a variety of illegal criminal activities involving uh, environment, everything from illegal logging to poaching. And that, that particular effort is ongoing and has resulted in some very high level uh, poachers that have been uh, absconded from, from uh, criminal prosecution uh, in their countries have been apprehended. One is um, Praj Kumar Praja, who was just uh, arrested in Malaysia for uh, being a renowned rhino poaching uh, ringleader. So it has, it has, has had its benefits. The, the overall um, effort that Interpol, particularly the subdirectorate that I represent, the Environmental Security Subdirectorate, spends a lot of its time going across the globe, um, uh, developing capacity building, particularly in the law enforcement arena. 
the void that exists right now is not necessarily in the presence of game rangers, but in the uh, more complex criminal investigative demands and also the void in criminal forensics. And that is something that's in high demand right now. We know there's a lot of organizations that are undertaking that effort. But filling the void to try to prosecute and try to make a case out of a, 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 a particular uh, circumstance of evidence and how you document that is so fundamental to many of us that have been in law enforcement for all these years that, that is in higher demand now because a lot of prosecutions are not occurring because of the mishandling of evidence and presenting something for court. So we're making great strides in, in that arena. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go right ahead. No, I was just going to say, next time you arrest one of these poaching magnates, call me. I'd like to be there with my camera and ask them really uncomfortable questions while they're in cuffs. So would I. Okay. <laughs> I'll give you my email address. Uh, we, I, I do want to bring in somebody from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Thank you. Uh, Brian Arroyo, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Assistant Director for International Affairs. Thank you for this great dialogue. I, I'm very, very encouraged to continue to see the synergies that are finally coming together to deal with this issue. Um, I want to caution us a little bit about something. We all like numbers. We all like stats. We all like to know how many millions of dollars, how many poachers we captured, how many bad guys went down. But ultimately, we need to do the same amount of effort and put the same amount of priority on demand reduction. Because it's about economics, as you will have mentioned throughout the, the, the discussion. As long as there's somebody willing to pay enough for the price uh, and, and for that, that artic article, it's going to be made available. Because until you link the risk, the high risk of doing that heinous crime with a lower amount of money for it, we're not going to make the final push to get this done. So my question to you all is, demand reduction efforts are out there. We do campaigns. We do PSAs. We do all of that. Question is, how do we measure that in the same amount of perhaps importance as we measure all of these arrests that we made? Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here. Thank you uh, for the acknowledgment of the Fish and Wildlife Service earlier. Uh, it is great to be in a great partnership. We do want to thank the law enforcement officers outside at the exhibit very much. Uh, and big thanks to all of you. Can I just say one quick thing? Uh, as uh, co-anchor of ABC News Nightline, uh, we have uh, put our money where our mouth is repeatedly over the last decade in covering this issue. Um, I'm open to pitches. Uh, <laughs> my email address is, I'm not kidding, dan.b.harris at abc.com. If you've got a story, especially you guys, uh, <laughs> email me. And we will go anywhere on the planet to catch people doing this. dan.b.harris at abc.com. And now, uh, as we conclude, Aldo is going to uh, make a few comments, and then we'll, we're off to... Uh... There they are. Oh, there they are. Hey, guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Donald. I think effectively we ran out of time. Um, I would like to thank you for teasing the best out of all of us in, in a very short oh, period of time. Thank you. I think you did a great job. Obviously, to thank WCS, um, Christian Zampera, I don't know where he is, but his entire team for making this, this event possible. Uh, thanking the panelists, of course, my fellow panelists, but also especially uh, the ambassadors of Germany, Gabon, and Thailand for magnificent work they're doing precisely at the UN Dan to make us all work uh, better uh, together. I wanted to thank somebody else, a group of people. It's the Rangers and the Scouts, the thousands of them out there, <laughs> all over Africa, in Nepal, in Bangladesh, in Mexico. Uh, they are sacrificing at times their lives to, to, to ensure that generations in the future can actually have, have a look at this biodiversity uh, in, in their natural habitat. Thank you all. Thanks to the public. Thanks for your questions. Uh, we also have an email address, all of us here and uh, at the UN, at the UNODC in particular, and as a staunch and very proud member of ICRIC, the International Consortium to Combat Wildlife Crime. We are at your disposal, and um, we hope, honestly hope, that next year, in exactly one year, we can actually sort of share even better news. Thank you. And there is a reception. You're all invited. <laughs>